Welcome to this talk, uh, which is going to be about computational design. Um, don't worry, a big part of this talk is going to be explaining what that actually means. Um, I am Paul Jeffries. I don't know if this slide is going to go on. So, I'm Paul Jeffries, um, and on the screen right now is a little bit of a sort of potted CV. Uh, so, I've been in the industry about 10 years. Um, I started out uh, working for Arup in uh, the Advanced Geometry Unit, AGU there, uh, working on all kinds of uh, weird, wibbly wobbly geometries. Um, when that shut down in 2010, I moved over to Arup Associates, which is kind of the, um, the architectural practice attached to Arup. Um, and then last year, I moved over to Ramble, uh, where my job title is uh, Computational Design Lead and Chief Digital Zoologist. Um, so that's what I do during the day. Um, in the evenings, I also uh, teach on computational design and related subjects uh, here on the parametric engineering course, um, but also uh, at the Architectural Association Design Research Laboratory um, and at the Bartlett School of Architecture as well. Um, and I'm what you might call a computational designer. Um, that's not necessarily a title I would choose to use all that often because it's a little bit unclear sometimes what people actually mean by that. Um, lots of people call themselves that, uh, but there's different types of computational designers. So in my case, it means that I am a structural engineer um, and also a software developer. Um, so uh, one way of putting that is that I kind of spend half my time designing structures for buildings and the other half developing tools that help me design structures for buildings. Um, although really, and something that I'll hopefully get across during this talk, is that there's actually quite a lot of crossover there, so it's not just sort of half and half. Um, and this is a selection of some of the projects that I've worked on in the past, uh, some of which I will talk about in a bit more detail uh, later on. Um, so what I'm going to cover tonight is, first of all, what is computational design? What do I mean when I say computational design? Uh, if not, what other people mean? Um, where that kind of discipline came from and how it evolved. Um, a few projects that I've worked on where I've been applying uh, these techniques and, and kind of what happened. Um, and then I'll finish by looking a little bit at what the current trends in the industry are and where I think they might end up um, when those of you who are students kind of um, conducting practice. So first of all, what is computational design? What am I talking about when I say computational design? Um, so it's a little bit of an open question, really, because computational design is still a very uh, new uh, subject area. Um, not a lot of sort of definitions have, have kind of um, solidified yet. Um, so it kind of relates to different software packages, kind of scripting, stuff like Grasshopper and Dynamo, um, certain optimization techniques, these all kind of fall under computational design. Um, but uh, that itself can also be a bit confusing. There's also all these other different uh, phrases that you might have heard of, like digital design, parametric design, algorithmic design, generative design, all these different things. Um, so. How exactly those relate to one another is, is still a little bit of a vexed question. Uh, I've kind of put up here a Venn diagram that kind of shows where I consider them to fit in, but different people use these terms in slightly different ways and to mean slightly different things. Um, so I kind of view computational design as being a sort of a subset of overall digital design, um, and then with kind of parametric design, optimization, and generative design as subsets of that. Um, and there's also BIM as well. Uh, which lots of people are talking lots about. So some people consider computational design to be part of BIM. I don't necessarily agree with that. I think there's a pretty big overlap. Um, and a lot of the time when we're talking about computational design, we're also talking about BIM. But there are also times when we're talking about BIM and not computational design and vice versa. Um, so before we can kind of really get to the heart of what computational design is, it's worth kind of starting from something that does have a settled definition, um, which is design itself. So if we go to the Fount of All Wisdom Wikipedia, uh, what that says is design is the creation of a plan or convention for the construction of an object, system, or measurable human interaction, uh, which I think is probably quite a good definition. 
Um, and I especially like the part of this, which is a plan or convention for the construction of something. So it's not an object itself, it's how you go about building that object. Um, and design is also a process. Um, so what I've got up on the screen here uh, is the sort of standard REBA stages uh, that you go through in a construction project. So these are kind of rigidly defined. Uh, each stage, you go through a certain portion of design development, you have some deliverables at the end of that, um, and then if you're lucky, you get to go on to the next stage, and the project progresses until it's completed. Um, so this is kind of theoretically uh, the process of design, but uh, as those of you who are in practice may appreciate, it's often a little bit messier than that, um, and it's not quite such a linear process. So typically, you'll start with some kind of briefing from the client. Um, from that, you'll try and understand what it is that they really um, want out of you and what kind of what's important to them out of that design. Based on that, you might come up with some ideas for how you want to answer that brief and how you want to develop your design. Um, so then, once you come up with those ideas, you kind of want to know whether they're the right ideas. So you'll sketch stuff out. Uh, you might write stuff out, you might even do a few sort of early calculations, and then you'll go back to talk to the client, to talk to other members of the design team, other disciplines, and see how what you're coming up with fits in with, with their ideas as well. And what that might result in is then you evolving your ideas and generating new ones and so on and so forth. And based on those initial set of ideas, you'll start making decisions about the core principles that you're going to use uh, when you're developing your design. So how are different parts of the design are going to work? What sort of strategies you're applying to that design? Um, and then that will be something that you'll want to communicate with other people as well. And you'll also want to make sure not just that it meets the client's requirements, but also that it meets the requirements of the laws of physics, say. Um, so you'll want to do some calculation on that. You'll want to run some analyses. Um, you'll want to check those principles make sure that they make sense for that project. Based on that, you'll then refine the design a bit more. You'll sort of start to hone in on particular section sizes and particular um, solidified arrangements. And then that will feed back into your design principles. You might need to change some of those to adapt to certain things. While all this is going on, your client is maybe having a rethink and thinking, oh, well, actually, I don't want this to be 100 meters tall. I want it to be 150 meters tall, or I want this to seat 40,000 people instead of 30,000 people. And that will have an impact on your design. You'll need to revisit your assumptions um, and see whether what you've done still fits for that particular scenario, or whether you'll need to um, revisit your initial assumptions. Eventually, you'll get to a stage where you can begin to actually set things down and start to document um, the design that you've come up with, um, which all then feeds back into that process again. Um, until finally, you're ready to actually submit this information to a contractor and have them actually build the thing. Um, while they're building it, you want to monitor it. You as the designer want to make sure that they are building what you designed. Um, very often, that will not, in fact, be the case. So you'll need to then make sure that what they have built will still work, um, that it will still fit in with what you've assumed, and, and that everything is still going to work, and potentially you might need to tweak a couple of things in your design in order to um, adapt to those kind of on-the-ground changes. And eventually, the project will be complete. You'll need to review what you've done, um, and hopefully you'll have learned some things about that that you can then apply to future projects. So the real process of design is a little bit messier than that kind of linear arrangement down the middle would suggest. Um, it's very sort of cyclical. It's very iterative. Uh, there's a lot of going backwards and forwards and things like that. Um, so it's hard to say too much about the structure of this. But one thing you can do, uh, at least I think you can do, is divide these design activities into two different categories. Um, so the way I've set up this diagram, kind of the top half of the screen, these are what I call mental activities. Um, and the bottom half of the screen is what you might consider physical activity, the things you actually do. So on the mental side of the equation, that is where you are kind of understanding the client brief, uh, making sure that you have the right ideas about what they want, generating new ideas, generating concepts, making decisions about how you're going to progress, um, and essentially developing the logic of that design. 
On the physical side of things, you're going to want to be testing out those ideas, you'll be doing calculations, you'll be drawing things up, you'll be communicating those back to the other stakeholders in the project. And finally, eventually, you'll be creating a particular fixed form of that design. Um, so I've called this second set physical, but these days, a lot of that is actually being done more and more virtually rather than physically. Um, so whereas we used to have to draw everything out by hand on drawing boards, we're now using computers and CAD software to draw things up instead. Um, whereas previously, if we wanted to see what a project or a building might look like in 3D, we'd have to build a model, um, a physical model, that is. Now we can build a model inside the computer, look at that in 3D, kind of render it out, look at it, look at sort of the BIM model, uh, examine uh, exactly what's going on in that model and sort of use that uh, to visualize what it will look like. Um, and whereas we used to have to calculate things uh, by hand and kind of look up things on table, we now have software to help with those tasks as well. Um, so these are all examples of using computers to help with design, but they aren't necessarily computational design, or at least not what I would consider to be computational design. Um, and the reason that I say that is that these are essentially just taking the existing processes and putting them into a computer. So instead of drawing on a piece of paper, you're essentially treating the computer as that piece of paper. Instead of modeling with cardboard, you're treating the computer as that bit of cardboard, and so on and so forth. And I think that that represents a bit of a missed opportunity in how you might want to use computers, because computers aren't just this sort of static sheet of paper where you do something and it can never change. Computers themselves are machines that run processes based on logic. They're kind of inherently iterative and active and dynamic. Um, so in my view, kind of treating them as a static thing sort of misses out on an opportunity. Um, and that opportunity is that because you can model logic inside a computer and not just geometry, you can start to use a computer, as well as on the physical side of things, to help you out with the mental side of design as well, and to help guide your thought process, processes and to actually model that logic which is going into the design and to test that out and help develop it. So my kind of one-line definition of what computational design is, as opposed to just regular old design, is that it's a change in the medium of design expression from geometry or just data to logic instead. So instead of expressing something as a simple drawing or as a sort of a set of static things, what you're doing is you're expressing the logic that goes to build up that model. Um, and that is part of your overall kind of analysis and design process. So it's not just using computers, it's using kind of code and algorithms as design tools. So to give a very simple example of that, uh, consider the humble regular column grid, um, which is a pretty common sight in a lot of buildings. Um, there are a couple of ways that you might want to describe this. So you could describe this by saying, well, we've got one column, and that's at this position. We've got another column, which is at these coordinates. We've got another one, which is here, and another one, which is here, and so on and so forth. And when you kind of draw something out by hand, or when you just sort of draw something in AutoCAD, say, um, that's essentially how you're defining that grid. But I think it's a little bit more natural, when you have an arrangement like this, to instead describe it by saying, well, I've got five columns in a row with this spacing, by three columns in another row with this spacing. So A, it's a bit more natural and a bit quicker to actually say that. Um, and also, uh, it means that you define this logic, and if you change those input parameters, if you say I want more columns or less columns, or I want my spacing to change, that is something that can be accommodated without having to go through and individually change every single uh, position of those columns. Um, so one thing I have to apologize for is that uh, I'm talking about computers. Uh, computers are bastards. Um, and sometimes you produce lovely animated GIFs which then don't work uh, on uh, the hardware available. So I apologize for the shoddy state of some of the videos in this presentation. Uh, you may have to use your imagination a bit. Um, but essentially, uh, what this image is meant to convey 
is that if you can define that relationship that exists between different columns in your grid, then why not also define the relationships between those columns and the framing arrangement which connects those columns in that grid? Why not define the relationship between the floor that that supports and the next story up in the building? Why not define the relationship between your overall column grid and your core and its size and position and your facade and your roof and all of these different aspects of the design? Um, and once you've done that, then a simple change to any one of those logical things can propagate throughout your model. So when this is kind of set up to involve parameters, this is what we might call parametric design. Um, so that's kind of an overview of what it is, and I'll come back and, and talk about that a bit more with relation to a few sort of concrete project examples a little bit later. Um, but one point I want to make is that in a sense, what I'm talking about is kind of the cutting edge of, of design development, but in another sense, it's actually very, very old indeed. And in fact, it predates computers. So kind of the definition that I provided, uh, if there's a flaw of it, it's that it's purely about logic. It's not about computers. Um, so this guy here, you may be familiar with. Uh, his name is Anthony Gaudi. He's a Spanish Catalan architect. Um, and he's somebody that I might choose to claim as a computational designer, even though he died 20 years before computers were really a thing. Um, so Gaudi didn't have computers available to him. Um, what he did have, however, is this, some bits of chain. Um, and the chain is an interesting thing from a structural point of view, um, because the links in that chain are not really connected together in any real way. So when you suspend a chain, there's no real bending capacity between these links. There's no real sort of shear capacity, or at least not that much. Um, so when you hold up a chain, suspend it by two points and apply a force, let's say the force of gravity, um, that chain is then going to have to, it's got no choice really, it's going to have to adopt a form where it's resisting that force purely in tension. Um, so this was Gaudi's computer. Um, and what he did was he built models out of these chains, um, which represented um, kind of upside down versions of buildings that he wanted to describe. So churches and cathedrals in this case. Um, so what he was doing there is he was generating a form, which in the case that he was designing for acted purely in tension. But if you took that and flipped it upside down, so he used to put mirrors under this so you could see what it looked like upside down, then you end up with a form which is very strong in compression, where all the forces, or at least all of the gravity forces, um, are acting in compression. And some materials, such as stone, which are very much stronger in compression than they are in tension, this produces a very optimal uh, arrangement of the building. So Gaudi was essentially parametrically modeling here. Um, his parameters were kind of the length of his chains, the positions of his chains, the loading that he applied to his chains, but the geometry was an output of that logical process. He wasn't directly controlling the geometry, he wasn't directly sculpting it, although he did of course do that uh, in some areas as well. Um, he was using this, this sort of logical process in order to derive a design which met his particular criteria. Um, so he was one of the first people to do this, but there are certainly others that, that sort of got in on the app before dawn of computers. So Heinz Eisler, um, he's very famous for these kind of ice sculptures. He would take a sheet, hang it up outside, spray it with water, wait for it to freeze. Um, and then it would naturally adopt these forms where when you remove the supports, um, it could stand just based on this very, very thin sheet of ice that had formed on it. Um, and he used these as inspiration to then develop um, very, very thin, very, very long span, concrete shells, uh, a little bit like what you can see in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, Fry Otto, of course, um, specialized in kind of lightweight and tensile structures, um, and he needed to know what these things would look like before he, you know, sort of spent a load of money cutting up sheets to build them. Um, and he also used a physical process to model that, uh, well, a couple of physical processes, including soap film form finding. Um, so he would model the tensile canopy as a soap film 
and see what form that would take. So these are all kind of proto-parametric uh, or computational design, if you like. Um, they're using logical processes, in this case physical processes, in order to derive uh, the essence of their designs. Um, which is not that much different from what we might want to do these days inside a computer. Um, it's just we have a slight advantage over them. It's a bit easier for us because we're not restricted to purely physical processes. We can model any kind of process that we want. Um, so the first real use of um, computers in design uh, was on the Sydney Opera House, uh, which was designed by the architect Bjorn Utzon and Ovarif as the engineer. Um, and the original sort of design for this, uh, original Jorn Utzon's sort of original sketches were very kind of free form. Um, so Arup's job was to kind of take that and then rationalize it into something that can be built. So all of these shells here, uh, they're all actually segments of a sphere. Um, but even so, that was a very complicated geometry by its time. Um, so Arup turned to computers in order to perform the calculations necessary to kind of set out and analyze that geometry. Uh, and this was a bit of a, well, when I say computers, I actually mean a computer. Um, and this was a bit of a sort of slow and arduous process back then. Um, you know, it'd take you a couple of weeks to write the code that would perform that operation. The actual calculation would take the best part of a day to perform. But even so, it's estimated that by doing this, they saved themselves about 10 years of kind of having to calculate everything by hand. Um, so that was one of the first uses of it in design, and again, GIF problems here, sorry. Um, but around about the same time, uh, a guy called Ivan Sutherland was developing something called Sketchpad, uh, which you've probably never heard of, it's not that famous, but it's actually one of the most influential bits of software that have ever been developed. Um, because it was really the program that had the first graphical user interface, um, the first GUI. Um, it was really the first sort of graphical CAD program. Um, it let you kind of sketch stuff out. But then what was also quite impressive about it, uh, which was sort of well ahead of its time, um, is that it also contained uh, a little bit of this kind of logical systemizing that I'm talking about. So what you could do in here is sketch something out and then set constraints on the geometry that you specified. So you could say all of these need to be at right angles to one another. One another. And then as you adapted your drawing, it would adapt to meet that. So the kind of thing that I'm talking about was actually in here right from the beginning. It's just kind of, it didn't really get taken up um, or developed further for quite a long time. There's quite a lot of sort of modern CAD packages that, that can't do anything like this. Um, and so kind of things progress. Um, Sketchpad, as I say, was well ahead of its time. It wasn't until about 20 years later when the first version of AutoCAD came out that uh, kind of CAD became um, a bit more accessible, mainly because it was cheaper and it ran on hardware that people could actually um, afford, uh, not necessarily because it was a very good program. Um, in 1987, uh, the first kind of properly parametric bit of engineering software came out, it's called ProEngineer, um, and this allowed you to specify parametric relationships between different um, parts of the model. Um, so that kind of started off a new thread of um, modeling packages similar to that, which ended up in Revit. Um, it didn't particularly get used all that much in, uh, in civil engineering and structural engineering, it, but it did take off quite a lot in kind of mechanical engineering, automotive, and things like that. Um, also in that same year, the first version of Excel came out. Uh, and Excel, I consider to be quite a good computational design tool in its own right, even though we're slightly trying to move away from it now. Um, and I also kind of credit that with popularizing the idea that maybe it will be quite a good thing if these packages allow you to record your own macros, write your own code, which would run inside that program. And that was something that then sort of came into lots of um, CAD packages and enabled a uh, form of computational design using that. Um, and then more recently, uh, in the last kind of 15 years or so, uh, we've seen the rise of these kind of visual programming languages that are embedded into CAD software. So starting with Generative Components in 2003, um, and then followed by Grasshopper in Rhino in 2007, which you'll be seeing a lot more of because that's my tool of choice. Um, and then sort of more recently, uh, Autodesk have released Dynamo as a kind of a uh, fairly direct copy of Grasshopper, but that operates inside Revit and the Autodesk suite of tools. 
Um, and while this software revolution was going on, architects were also starting to get on board with these computational tools and starting to use them to develop geometries that wouldn't really have been possible um, beforehand. So this is a very small selection of a very large sort of um, canon uh, of these kinds of projects. Um, and it was thought that this kind of evolved into its own distinct style, which uh, Patrick Schumacher named parametricism. Um, now, there's a little bit of controversy in this area. Um, and as I am only a lowly engineer and not an architect, I won't wade in on that too much. But one thing I do just want to make clear about parametricism is that uh, you shouldn't confuse parametricism as an architectural style with parametric design or computational design or anything like that. Um, there's a particular sort of uh, aesthetic associated with parametricism, which is these kind of very freeform shapes. Um, and there's a slight misconception that this is kind of what you get if you apply parametric tools. But of course, the tools can be applied in any way you want them to be. Um, they don't need to necessarily be applied only to this particular type of style, only to projects with very complicated geometry. They're a good way of dealing with any kind of complexity. Um, so I'll hopefully kind of expand on that a bit more in the projects I'm going to talk about here. So uh, I'm just going to kind of go through some of the projects that I've worked on in my career, um, where we've applied computational design techniques and kind of what we did with them. Uh, so I think the second project I ever worked on that actually got built uh, was this. Uh, this is the Danish pavilion for the Shanghai 2010 Expo, uh, which is something that uh, we worked on in AGU with uh, the Ark Ingalls group, big architects. Um, and this is kind of a, a big looping structure. Uh, you can kind of go in one end of this on a bike if you like and then cycle all the way around it. There's an exhibition space in there. Um, it's quite a funky idea, uh, but one problem from a structural engineering point of view is that this kind of lifts off and it swirls around, and there's about a 70 meter span around there going around the corner uh, between support points. Uh, so we, looking at this as structural engineers, really needed to milk every last bit of stiffness we could out of this. Um, so as well as this fairly chunky steel frame that underlies this, uh, we also wanted to take advantage of the outside metal skin of this building. Um, the architect, however, wanted to see perforations in this skin. They wanted to have you know, windows. Um, so what we arrived at in the end was a scheme where we were analyzing the stresses in that skin and based on that stress map, sizing the apertures in that skin accordingly. So the higher the stress, the smaller uh, the hole that we were prepared to cut out of it. So in some places, we kept it solid. Um, so this was kind of where the engineering and the architecture were kind of married together um, through uh, computational design. Um, another project that I worked on quite some time ago, uh, which uh, is famous or perhaps notorious is one word, uh, is the ArcelorMittal orbit uh, for the London 2012 uh, Olympic Games. Uh, so if you want to go to Stratford, you can see this and slide down it now. Um, and this is quite a complicated bit of geometry um, from a kind of one point of view, but actually the way that we develop that geometry is very simple. Um, the whole of that geometry was controlled through essentially a single spline, which determined the kind of uh, center line of that tubular diagrid. Uh, we then set up a grasshopper model um, in order to actually generate the center line structure going around that. Uh, we then applied structural properties to that, so sections, materials, things like that, loads and so on. And we could then export that out to our analysis package um, and also to uh, Tecla, which we then gave to fabricators as a means of uh, actually fabricating this complex geometry. Um, and what this workflow let us do is to make quite significant changes to that geometry very, very easily purely by modifying this initial center line and the parameters that attach to it that control things like the diagrid diameter. Um, so this was a collaboration with uh, the artist Anish Kapoor. Um, and what this let us do is to work more closely with him. So we could sit down with him and he could say, OK, I want to see what it looks like if I pull this part out here and pull this around here and see what happens there. We could then generate a new model, look at the implications of that, and either say, well, that's not a great idea, or yeah, that's great, go for it. 
Um, so we can kind of guide that process into something that kind of met his aspirations, um, but also works uh, structurally. Um, and the sort of the geometric part of that is something that came with Grasshopper, um, but one kind of barrier to uh, using things like Grasshopper in uh, structural engineering is that as structural engineers, we don't just care about geometry, which maybe architects do. Um, we care about kind of giving things sizes and sections and, and loads and putting things on them so that we have something we can actually analyze. If we have to kind of rebuild it completely in a new bit of software, then any benefit from parametrically um, generating it is lost. Uh, so in order to do that, I developed a bit of software uh, called Salamander, or to give it its full name, Structural Analysis Link and Manager for Data Entry and Retrieve. Um, and what this let us do is to add in some extra information into our Rhino model. So instead of just being simply curves and surfaces and points and so on, uh, we could represent these as finite elements, um, as kind of beams and columns and nodes and surfaces and so on. And we can apply um, the sections to that. Um, we could apply loads. Uh, and then we could rapidly export from that modeling environment um, a model in our uh, analysis software, um, and also out to, uh, in this case, Tecla. So then we had a model, we could run that and analyze it very, very quickly. Um, what we could also do with this bit of software was read back the results of that, so we could set up a loop where it would generate some geometry, export that out to uh, analysis, run that analysis, feed back those results, and then make changes based on those results. Um, so, is this not running? So, what this video shows here is a fairly simple model of a truss uh, being optimized based on that process. Um, so, it's randomly sort of manipulating these things and then gradually um, enhancing and evolving its way towards uh, the kind of optimal arrangement for that truss based on the parameters that we assigned. Um, so this tool, Salamander, was something that uh, I kind of kept building on and adding to uh, for about seven years while I was at Arup. Um, and it got used on a variety of different projects. Um, and one of the other projects that I worked on, coming back to our friend Gaudi, that I started off this history with, uh, was the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, uh, which is one of Gaudi's most uh, famous jobs. Um, and it's probably the most famous building site in the world. Um, so construction on this started in 1882, and it continues to this day. They're still building it. Um, and the part of this that I was looking at uh, was the tower, which is now being constructed over this point here, the Mary Tower. Um, and the challenge here was to come up with a design that could uh, support the structure of this, but that would be light enough to be able to be carried by the foundations uh, which had been kind of built 120 years earlier before they even really knew what was going to be placed on top of it. Um, so the initial plan, which was, which was found to be too heavy, uh, was to structure this as a steel diagrid internally, um, a kind of a concrete shell around that, and then stone cladding on the outside of that to give the visual appearance uh, that would match the rest of the building. Um, that was found to be a bit too heavy for the foundations that existed. So what we looked at instead um, was using the external stone cladding, rather than just as cladding hanging off there, as a part of the structure itself. Um, so stone, as I mentioned earlier, is very strong in compression, but it's not very great in tension. Um, so if stone goes into tension, it starts to crack. And of course, you get tension induced with bending and things like that. Um, so it's quite difficult to avoid that just with kind of unreinforced stone. Uh, so the solution that we looked at for this was for each of these panels in the building, um, essentially drilling holes for it, putting in tendons, tensioning it all up so that would squeeze the stone, put the stone into compression, um, and then that compression would cancel out any tension being induced by, say, wind loads or or simply moving it into position or anything like that. Um, now this was a little bit trickier than that, however, because all of these panels going up 
the tower. Uh, they were all kind of different shapes and sizes. Uh, they were all curved in two directions. Um, they all had these kind of triangular windows through them. And what that meant is that as you kind of go up this tower, the cross section is constantly changing. Uh, and consequently, the kind of centroid of these different stone blocks is changing as well. So to fit straight tendons through that is actually quite difficult because you might end up positioning that tendon in the wrong place and thereby actually inducing more bending than you're going to be taking out. Uh, so this is another problem that we looked at parametrically. Uh, so I set up a grasshopper and salamander model to look at each one of these panels going up the tower to generate a kind of simplified stick model of that. And then based on that, we could play around with those tendon positions, try and optimize those so that we got a uh, kind of a repetitive arrangement, a kind of a, a logic to that set out, um, and also the pre-stressing values. That would make sense going up the tower and would result in it not cracking. Um, and then that could be then analyzed and looked at and, and so on and so forth. So that's, that's the technique that we used in order to work out um, how to position and how to uh, stress these tendons. Um, something else that I developed while I was at Arup uh, was a little tool for the sports venue design team in Arup Associates. Um, so this was a team of sports architects um, who designed a lot of sports stadiums, seating arrangements for sports stadiums, things like that. Um, so I developed something for them called STAG uh, or Stadium Generator. Um, and the development of uh, stadium seating bowls is quite a good uh, candidate for these kind of techniques because it's based on a set of reasonably sensible rules. Um, so, for example, in the seats you're sitting in right now, there will be certain rules that set out how high each desk needs to be behind the one in front of it so that you can see over the heads of the people in front of you. And it's the same for stadium seating. So there's these rules which set out how this should be arranged. Um, and we developed a tool, or rather I developed a tool, um, in order to generate these forms, analyze them, and provide feedback, like kind of the quality of the view, the distance to the seating, um, kind of evacuation di distances, things like that. Um, so as far as we know, that's kind of the most advanced tool for that particular job um, in the world. And it was also a big improvement over what they had before. So before they were kind of using a semi-automated approach where they generate some profiles in Excel and then uh, kind of manually tweak those and loft them around to produce the full geometry. Uh, so that took about half an hour to test out an arrangement. With this tool, it took them about six seconds to do the same thing. And one of the projects that that was applied on, so I was working on this kind of supporting uh, the software side of things with the, with the um, sports architects, uh, but that I was also working on as a structural engineer, looking at the superstructure, uh, is the new Doha Tennis Stadium in Khalifa, uh, which is hopefully going to be built fairly soon. Um, and this is a 20,000 seat tennis stadium, uh, it's got a moving roof on top, it's got a kind of quite fancy freeform uh, facade around the concourse. Um, and we use computational design here, um, well, for quite a lot of stuff, bold, bold design for starters, um, but also to examine different possible structural framing arrangements. So we hit early on on this logic of supporting the roof uh, via this kind of reciprocal star arrangement of trusses, which would surround that central uh, opening. Um, and one of the key things that we wanted to decide early is how we should arrange that, um, because the arrangement of the structure here, of the structure here uh, had a big influence over the potential size of that aperture in the, si in the center of the bowl, and kind of how much light would come in, how much um, of the seating would be covered, and so on and so forth. So we first of all use this as kind of a geometric tool to study that and see what the best arrangement would be. Um, having done that, I took that forward and developed a whole structural model of the roof defined in Grasshopper and exported out to um, our analysis package and also um, Revit. So we had sort of analysis and documentation coming out of the same model. Um, I also used this then to develop the designs of the movable roof parts of that and also the concourse facade structure um, and to kind of tie all this together. Uh, so one of the big drivers on the main roof structure was the loading coming from the moving roof. It was quite heavy. It was something like a fully laden jumbo jet on each side, something like that. Um, so I hooked this up so that the results of uh, the 
movable roof section uh, were being extracted automatically, and those reaction forces being applied to uh, the trusses on the main roof. So we could then make sure that changes to that were being propagated throughout the design and everything was being controlled. Um, and this sort of made this easy enough that, that for part of this project, I was actually kind of designing all of this steel work pretty much by myself. Um, so I don't want to over, overstate that. There were other people on the project as well, looking at kind of connection design and, and wind loading and things like that. And uh, there was a whole mass of concrete underneath this that had about four or five people looking at. Um, but the fact that these tools existed enabled me to kind of essentially control all of that structural geometry and analyze it and look at it uh, much more quickly uh, than would otherwise have been possible. Not that I recommend doing a structure of this size all by yourself, however. Um, so the workflow for that, this is kind of the overall workflow, kind of starting from the initial architect's grid geometry and kind of working through um, the structure. Um, so this looks a little bit complicated. Kind of each one of these boxes here is essentially a separate file, but actually everything within that dotted line there was all being controlled from inside Rhino. So it, there was a sort of a single control point from which we were putting out these various different models, both for analysis and um, BIM. Uh, so that was pretty much the last thing I worked on at Arup. Uh, and then I got asked to come to Bramble uh, in order to take over uh, leadership of Bramble computational design. Um, so RCD uh, is something that has uh, existed for quite a while. So it was set up in 2011, I think, uh, in order to look at dealing with some of the geometric complexity of the Astana Library project, so another um, project by Big. Um, and they also worked on a number of sort of smaller projects looking at sort of high geometric complexity, kind of looking at developing um, kind of strongly theory-driven and design-driven um, geometry. So this is the Trada Pavilion. Uh, this is the Vanke Pavilion, I think I'm pronouncing that right, um, from the Milan 2015 Expo. Um, and this is the Creod Pavilion, which won a nice T Small Projects Award. Um, so I can't actually take any credit for any of these because these all happened before I got there. Um, but now I'm kind of running this department, so um, it's kind of my responsibility to progress that legacy, um, but also to kind of move forward and do some other things. So um, we're also still working on kind of small scale projects of, of high geometrical complexity. Uh, of which this is kind of an extreme example of both. Um, so this was a sort of an exhibition that we put together for an internal leadership conference in Copenhagen. Uh, and we kind of designed this in essentially a couple of weeks. Uh, and then we had to design this so that it could be flat packed down, packed into three suitcases, taken to Copenhagen, assembled, taken down two days later, and then brought back. So if you want to see this, uh, it's in our main reception in our London office in Blackfriars. So come on by. Um, and also, one of the fun things I did here was to kind of hack uh, a Lego train to make it automatically run back and forwards. So that was my fun bit of this project. Um, well, what we're also trying to do, as well as working on these kind of very small, very niche projects, is to try and push this forwards to make computational design techniques much more mainstream uh, and much more generally applied on a larger variety of different projects. Uh, which don't necessarily have geometric complexity, but will, of course, be complex all in their own way. Um, so uh, part of what I've been doing since I arrived is to kind of generate this support structure for um, computational designers with various specializations, um, part of which is something called the Gorilla Network. Um, and the idea behind here is that as well as this kind of core team of RCD, we've got a sort of a network of computational design specialists and kind of affectionados uh, in various different groups throughout the business. Throughout the business. Uh, so it's not now just kind of a little team sitting in a corner working on cool stuff. Um, it's something that we're trying to spread out a lot more into the rest of the business and make much more of kind of a part of standard operations. Uh, so we're running training, we're doing things like that. Um, and we're involved in kind of larger projects. Um, so uh, most of the projects that I've done recently uh, are kind of under NDA, so I can't really tell you too much about them, but I can tell you about the sort of approaches that we're taking and, and what we're sort of trying to do overall. Um, so this is uh, a kind of custom analysis um, on the facade of a building next to a railway line. Um, and this is sort of a, a 
fairly straightforward geometric check um, of the kind of angles uh, of reflection um, coming off of this facade um, and where that crosses uh, the sun path. So we get an idea now where we might have the sun bouncing off this facade directly into a train driver's eyes at kind of what time of year, uh, what the risk of that is, things like that. So kind of stepping a little bit outside the sort of structural domain where I've been involved previously into more custom types of uh, analysis. Um, we've also been doing a fair bit of kind of rationalization of uh, complex roofs. So this is a freeform stadium roof. Can't tell you what stadium. Um, and part of what we're doing here is looking at rationalizing that freeform geometry in order to reduce the number of unique panel types, um, but without compromising that overall geometry. So this was actually done by sort of two optimization loops running one inside another, one of which was kind of generating a different set of panel sizes and one of which was trying to fit those together um, in order to uh, kind of produce that geometry without leaving any gaps. Um, and another project that we've been heavily involved in, um, and again, this is not the best gift in the world, um, another project we've been heavily involved in is a large, in fact, very large residential project um, where we're looking at designing about 52 different um, buildings, about 250,000 new homes. Um, so a very large scale project, time scale is quite short. So we've been developing a set of tools that can help to uh, perform certain specific engineering functions on that. So um, there's kind of a bit of a gap we've noticed between the kind of FE tools, which are quite heavy duty and, and so sort of you sit there and run them and they chug away for a while, um, and the kind of the very early stuff. Um, so what we're developing is tools that have custom UIs that are built specifically for a particular purpose. And that means that it's then very easy for anybody, not just people with computational design skills, to pick those up and use those tools. Um, so this is COBRA, or Core Options Boundary Range Analysis, uh, which is for kind of essentially uh, sizing and looking at the arrangement of cores in a building. Um, this is TADPOL, uh, or Take Down Process on Loaded Elements. Um, which is a sort of graphical tool for very quickly doing uh, load rundowns just based on um, kind of the sort of information you got, might get from an architect and lets you then kind of optimize your column arrangements to meet uh, that loading. Um, and another thing we've been looking at is kind of taking the results of that uh, analysis and making them more accessible, um, which is not in this case, obviously, but uh, <laughs> taking that information and then sharing it with clients, with other members of the project team through uh, online dashboards using Power BI and things like that. Um, one other thing that we've been looking at, kind of picking up a little bit of work that the old RCD did, um, is ways in which we can start to get involved at an earlier stage on projects. So very often in an early stage of a project, an architect kind of works semi in isolation, developing an overall form for the building. Um, and then later on, an engineer will get involved. Um, by which it's potentially a bit too late to change some stuff. Um, so what we've been looking at doing is kind of helping that massing process uh, through computational design. Um, essentially, taking a building plot, generating different massing arrangements on that site, and then analyzing that through a variety of means in order to get some very early and quick feedback on what the optimal arrangement on that site might be. So based on this, we can generate huge numbers of different um, varieties of, of uh, building forms uh, on a particular site, and then we can examine those through various means. So we can look at the wind comfort level by doing some CFE on them. We can look at the uh, wind pressures. We can look at the thermal gain. Uh, we can look at the shading of those buildings, which is actually something that can be quite important. Um, we can look at generating uh, kind of potential framing arrangements for those buildings, and then looking at foundation loads that those generate. Um, we can look at travel distances within um, a site um, and we can take all these and we can kind of use that to very rapidly assess operations, uh, arrangements which either the architect has provided or that we've generated based on rules. Um, and we can kind of look at that and, and see which uh, arrangements are better from which uh, perspectives. Um, and what we can also do, as well as just kind of generating random ones, is we can then 
loop that into an optimization process, and we can get it to optimize uh, for that site based on various criteria. So we're talking to a couple of architects at the moment who are kind of working on this forwards. Uh, something else that I'm working on at the moment, uh, more as a kind of personal project, is a new version of Salamander. Um, so the old version of Salamander, I unfortunately had to leave behind at Arup when I left. Um, so I'm working on a new one. Uh, and this is called Salamander Free, uh, both because it's the third time I've had to rewrite the bloody thing from scratch. Um, and also free as in beer. So this is going to be something that we're going to put out as freeware. Uh, it's going to be built on open source code so other people can use it and get involved with the development of it. Um, and uh, here is another non-working GIF, which shows what that looks like at the moment. So I'll skip on from there. Um, so that's some of what we're doing at the moment, some of what we're progressing towards. Uh, I thought I'd finish just by looking at a couple of sort of trends in the industry, a couple of hot topics, and sort of uh, giving you my views on where they might end up. Uh, so one thing that all the cool kids are doing these days is virtual slash augmented reality. This is kind of the, the equivalent of the Power Ranger doll. Uh, if, you don't, if, you're an if you're an architect or an engineering company and you're not doing something like this, then you can't play with the cool kids in the playground. Um, so we're looking into this as well. Um, and this does have some very sort of promising applications for architects, kind of looking at, uh, well, essentially being inside their building before it's even been built. Um, and also on construction sites, kind of using augmented reality to stand on a building site, look around and see where everything needs to be. Um, from the structural design point of view, there's sort of slightly less direct applications, I would say, but still something that we have found with this is that actually modeling in this environment is a little bit easier and a little bit faster than doing it on a screen. Just because kind of when you're 3D modeling on a 2D screen, pretty much every other click is going to be you rotating the camera or trying to set up your construction plane or doing something like that. So um, it does have some applications in design as well, I think, to sort of make uh, that process faster and more accessible. Um, they will have to make those headsets a little bit more comfortable to wear long term before that's sort of a, a, um, a viable solution, however. Um, a lot of other things which are coming up now are various new construction methods which are being tried out um, and which are kind of being prototyped. Um, so using robots, using um, 3D printing in order to generate, uh, in order to build uh, new um, forms. Um, and in fact, that uh, image on the right hand side there is something that a few of my uh, AA students were looking at, which is essentially building out of robots. Uh, so each one of those little white cubes is a separate little robot which can kind of climb over the other ones and build up um, structures around itself. Um, a similar sort of theme, um, this is some more AA research I should probably say, um, looking at using drones as construction methods as well in order to build these kind of tensile structures. Um, and what's really interesting about this stuff is that as well as being able to use these drones sort of as workmen, um, you can also start to use these drones as agents in the design process themselves. So rather than predefining what you want these drones to do, you can just give these drones a bit of intelligence and a bit of kind of logic about how they ought to operate, and they can then act autonomously in order to generate structure. So this is kind of computational design out in the real world, generating new structures that you can't necessarily predict in advance. Obviously, that's a Slightly limited application, possibly, but um, it's exciting nonetheless. Um, and that kind of artificial intelligence is, I think, something that's, that's going to uh, become more and more important. Uh, so you might have seen images like this before. This is from Google DeepMind. Uh, and the way this works is to take uh, an artificial neural net, uh, which is kind of a, a computational mock-up of a human brain, uh, which is designed for... Um, sort of picture recognition. Um, so you show this thing a bunch of different pictures of buildings, and you say, these are pictures of buildings. And then it can look at another picture and say, oh, that's a picture of a building. What you can also do is to sort of flip that in reverse, say, what does a building look like? Generate me an image that looks like a building. And it will come up with sort of stuff like this. So it will kind of regurgitate what it's learned, and it will generate new uh, images based on what it gets the impression that a building looks like. Um, so this is quite cool and funky um, for sort of 2D images. For the kind of things that we want to design, uh, it's not quite so applicable at the moment, um, largely because the training data that you need to give it is so much more complex. 
Um, so the nice thing about images is that pretty much everything you need to know about an image is in that image. Um, you just need to have that image and then say, this is a building. Um, whereas we have a little bit more um, kind of uh, well, parameters uh, to our design projects. We, we want to meet specific criteria for buildings. Um, so this sort of uh, artificial intelligence isn't necessarily applicable yet, but it's a stepping stone towards uh, more generalizable solutions. Um, and my kind of uh, idea of where this is going to lead us to is going to be something a little bit like Iron Man, uh, for those of you who've seen that, um, and uh, his little computer friend Jarvis, um, with some modifications. So I don't think we're going to have holograms anytime soon, but we might have augmented reality um, that allows us to design in 3D. Um, and I do think that following this kind of trend going from punch cards to code to visual programming languages, um, one thing that's going to start coming out is going to be uh, AIs which have the language processing ability and also the awareness of the context of the design um, that you will be able to communicate that design logic to them sort of verbally. You'll be able to talk to them, uh, they'll talk back. Uh, they might be slightly less sarcastic than they are in the films. Who knows? Um, and what that then allows you to do is to sort of open up this computational design process to uh, anyone. Um, one thing I would say about that though, or at least I hope I can say about that, is that that doesn't necessarily mean that kind of coding skills um, and being able to use Grasshopper and Dynamo and things like that are going to be uh, sort of less valuable because uh, there are obviously going to be some things where it becomes more, uh, where geometry is too complicated to express it verbally and it becomes easier to uh, express it geometrically instead. Um, so just as the way that sort of Sketching and model making have not become um, obsolete. Um, I think that the kind of skills that uh, I'm trying to encourage you to develop now um, are also going to um, still be useful in the future. Um, so if you haven't had enough of me already, uh, then please feel free to follow me on Twitter uh, and check out the uh, RCD blog, which is at these, uh, this URL here. Um, so there you can get a bit more information on kind of what we're doing in RCD. You can see a kind of a, uh, a written up version of the first part of this talk, things like that. Um, so a bit more information in there. Um, so thank you very much for listening. Uh, I hope I haven't bored you too much. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. <laughs>